Unwanted clicks and pops are an unfortunate byproduct of working with digital audio. These anomalies can occur when the audio waveform is interrupted in mid-cycle or cut off as a result of awkward region edits or recording takes. Clicks and pops can also occur in an otherwise great recording due to inappropriate buffer or clock settings on the audio interface at the time of recording. In this section, we'll look at techniques to fix these issues with minimal fuss so you can focus on more creative endeavours. Crossfades are the easiest way to smooth over unnatural transitions between newly adjoined regions. We will begin by looking at how to create crossfades on individual tracks and how to apply crossfades on mass. Here's my track. Let's have a quick listen. And we'll take this section here, which is the palm mute section on the guitar. And we'll create a fade in, fade out and some cross fades. So if I press control and option together, I get my zoom tool so I can, my third tool, so I can just draw a box around it. And you, as you can see, there's no fade ins or cross fades at the moment. If there were, you would see a fade in or a fade out like that. So usually I fade in and out and cross fade on all regions. Uh, whether it needs it or not. If we listen to this pole mute section, it actually comes in quite nicely. It doesn't come in too abruptly at all. And this crossfade seems to work okay as well. So that's quite smooth, but I'll still put in a crossfade anyway, out of habit. So if I wanted to, say, just apply a, a fade in to this section here and click, highlight the section and I'd go over to my inspector and in the region I'd see this function here fade in and fade out and in here where it says type I've got fade out and I've got different types of crossfade so if I was just to type in 10 that 10 means I've now created a fade in of 10 milliseconds and 10 20 milliseconds is a standard that I'll apply to all regions and then obviously listen and adjust accordingly. So that was just for one region. If I wanted to apply fade-ins across multiple regions, I'd select them all. Double click in my fade-in box. If I type in 10 again, didn't like it because I had one already selected as you can see, I have to select the other three and type in 10. And there I've created four fade-ins at 10 milliseconds. Fade-outs. So that doesn't have a, a long, slow fade-out. It's quite abrupt, so I'm gonna select it and all four this time, fade-out, and again, I'm gonna type, type in 10 for 10 milliseconds. And we can see that there's my fade-out. For longer um, examples, so perhaps on this introduction here, let's have a listen to this introduction here. Maybe, maybe that requires a slightly longer fade out. So if I type in 100 this time, that'll be 100 milliseconds. If you really wanted to hear the fade out, if I just put a zero on the end of that and make it a thousand, Now you can really hear it working. With crossfades, if I now select all of those regions, going back to my original palm mute section, and here in type, if I change that now from fade out to crossfade, and I type in 10, you can see that it's created a crossfade of 10 milliseconds. Here the goal is just to stop the click of the, of the overlap. I'm not, I don't really want it to fade out noticeably and fade in noticeably. I just want to get rid of any clicks. So the transition's smooth. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's quite nice. Just remember, if you wanted to do it without having to go over here and type in the number, the numerical value, you can use your fade tool, which is Control and Shift together. And that will turn the pointer tool into a fade tool. And of course, if you click the center using Control and Shift, you can adjust the curve. You can see the curve adjusting it over here. So if you wanted something that would, in essence, start slow, if you think of a fader movement, so if you think of that as a fader movement, it kind of, it starts slow and then it really moves down quite quickly. If you wanted something that would start slower and then speed up, it would be more like that. So a slow fader and then quicker towards the end. That's the difference between the two. Sometimes clicks and pops appear in the body of an audio region. These can be caused by clipping that occurred during the recording, or sample rate clocking errors, or even by edited audio files that weren't bounced together without proper crossfades. In previous versions of Logic, you would edit audio files in the audio file editor, which sat alongside the audio track editor. But this has been removed from this window, so you get a track editor and a smart tempo editor, but you don't see the audio file editor. It's still there though, it's hidden away. And if I go to Open Project Audio, here's my audio. So I've selected a guitar, by the way, I should say. I've selected a guitar region, that one will be fine. And let's just say, for example, that guitar had a clip on it for some reason. I could then go into the Open Project Audio window. That's the region that I've selected. And if I double clicked it, I open the old audio file editor. And in this editor, you can zoom in and using the pencil tool, which is my command click tool, you can draw, redraw the waveform. So for example, if that was a click, I could just draw a line and it would get rid of the click. So if you do get any clicks on audio files and you're looking for the audio file editor, it is still there, it's hidden away, I suppose, just to make the interface more slick, they hid that away. So select the audio region window, open project audio, double click on the audio file and it will launch the audio file editor and zoom in. And then with your pencil tool, you can redraw the waveform. And it's the best way of getting rid of clicks and pops and unwanted noises. One of the advantages offered by digital editing is the ease with which new parts are created from existing material through copying and pasting. In order to achieve a convincing result, however, it is of equal importance to use judicious edits to assemble the new parts as well as creating seamless transitions between the constituent building blocks. I want to begin by looking at take folders or track stacks as we now call them. In my example here, I've got 64, 65 tracks of audio. Um, actually, maybe more, around about 81 tracks of audio. But what I tend to do is once I get to the mix stage, I'll pack them into track stacks so that I can see things a little bit more clearly. So you can see I've got kick sum and I've got one, two, three uh, kick signals and then I've got snare sum, toms and overs bass and so on. And each of them have been packed into a track stack or um, a folder, as I've said. I want to look at this acoustic guitar part here and I'm just going to open up the acoustic guitar part. You can see here that I've actually got it over four tracks. It's essentially a double track acoustic guitar. So when I recorded it, if I was just to drag that bit out, you'll see that that bit now I've moved on to its own tracks here. And the reason for that was because I wanted to change things as it went from the uh, as it transitioned from the introduction to the uh, in this case the verse so if i just go into the mixer we'll see that it's packed into what's called a 
a track stack rather than a folder. And the way that I can tell that is because I've got processing on the uh, actual output of the track stack. You can see that there's my four acoustic guitar signals. Their output is bus 24 and the input of the track stack is bus 24. If I just uh, flatten that to undo it, so if I go to the track and flatten, that will now undo it. You can still see that the output's a track 24, but the actual stack is gone. So if I select them all from the track header and I go to create track stack, I get two options. One is to create a folder track, which is a basic track stack that lets you mute solo and control the volume for the main track. So if I just create a folder track, you can see that there's my four tracks into which they are packed into the sub 11 folder, just a name that's given. And you can see that the output is just fader, mute, solo, and automation. If, however, I was to choose, and I go back to flatten stack, if I was to choose this time a summon stack, this now is a multi-purpose track stack that mixes its subtracks and can be saved as a patch. This type can also record and play back MIDI or remote control recording on audio only subtracks. So if I just go back, undo, 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 and go back to where I had the track stack, you can see they're all packed up into the folder, but on this particular track stack, I can add processing some effects or some buses, and then I can save it, as I said, as a uh, setting. Now, the reason why I've split this up over to four, four tracks is because, as you can see here, I've got two acoustic guitars panned at about 25, 20, 26 to 29, left and right and then when it goes into the verse in this case the panning gets slightly wider and i've also added some processing on our which is a flanger so let's have a quick listen see what that sounds like it's probably not noticeable in the mix but in headphones you might notice it Indeed, it's slightly wider, very subtle, but and notice on the end here how the fade is a little bit longer. Let's have a listen to that in the context of the mix. And you don't really notice it because you've got a clean guitar and an acoustic guitar at the same time. But that's really how track stacks can, can be used creatively, where you've split things up uh, and then you've put them into a track stack just so then you can see things a lot easier on your screen. And then of course you can apply processing and uh, auxiliary effects, bus effects to the overall track stack, which I use quite often. So here on the uh, drums, for example, so here's all my drums. Actually, there's all my drums, those three there. And they're all going down bus 32, which is a compressor, a VCA compressor. They're also going down bus 18, which again is a different type of compressor, but it's another type of compressor. So I'm using parallel compression on the drums. So I might have individual processing on each of the tracks, like I've got here, I've got a noise gate, and some EQ, but then the track stack for the kick, snare, toms, overheads, they're all going down two buses, which are applying some parallel compression. And in addition on the snare, I've got one, two snare tracks, and I've got that going down bus 31, which is the reverb for the snare. So I've applied the reverb, the snare reverb to the track stack rather than the individual tracks. If I now wanted to apply the processing and effects that I've got on that acoustic guitar, I can do so by just clicking the solo on the track stack itself. And what that will do is that will solo anything that's coming through 
bus 24, in this case the four guitars. And what it will also do quite cleverly is it will solo the buses that I've got. So I've got some reverb and I've got some um, uh, a multi presser as well on the acoustic guitar. So if anything else is being sent to each of these effects. So let's say, for example, here on the clean guitar, I've also got that going down the same bus, the same uh, reverb bus as the acoustic guitar. But because it's not been soloed, because it's just this one that's soloed, then it will mute that effect, it'll mute that guitar going down that effect. So I just get the acoustic guitar. Now, if I wanted to create a stereo file, a new stereo file of my acoustic guitar, I can do so quite easily by selecting the beginning and end. So I'll create a new file starting at bar one and going to the end of the track. Bearing in mind, there might be some reverb on the end of that track, so I'll just give it a little bit longer. And with that soloed, I go to my master output. I've actually got some process it on the master output um, and if I just play you'll see and hear the difference so I don't really want to add my master output process in so I'm just going to bypass it and Levels are about the same, but I usually make sure that it's around about minus 12 uh, decibels, dB uh, full scale, just as because that's a standard really. So I usually end up, try to end up for getting the output around about that mark there. So if I needed to, I could adjust it using gain. And that's why I have a gain plugin on my master output. So now if I go to bounce, I'll create a, a PCM file as an AIFF with resolution and sample rate set to the project resolution and sample rate. And rather than do the whole file, I'm just going to do a section just to speed things up for this example. Go back to bounce. So now you can see I've just got that selection. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to go real time or offline. Make sure normalization is off. And I'm going to add to project so that I can drag it in from within the project. It will ask me, however, where I want to save this because it thinks I'm creating a stereo mix. So it's saying, do you want to save that externally as well? Which I'll just save it onto the desktop. And of course, because I've got it selected to add to the project, if I go to my project files right at the bottom, I'll see my new region. It makes it a lot easier for me to drag it in from here than to go and find it on the desktop and drag it in. However, if I had forgotten to check the Add to Project uh, checkbox and I needed to drag it in, then the easiest way to do it is to go to All Files, choose Home, navigate to Desktop, and you'll see your file there and you can drag it in. We'll now look at using mixer groups for editing and how to temporarily disable group editing when you want to edit individual regions. You can use mixer groups to apply a variety of operations, volume, panning and automation to multiple channels at the same time. In addition, you can use mixer groups to simultaneously edit tracks. In this exercise, you will use the mixer group feature to place the drum tracks into an edit group and quickly make changes to the regions across all the drum tracks. I've opened up my mixer window by pressing X on my keyboard or I can go to view and from here I can choose show and hide mixer and I've zoomed in to show all my drum tracks so kick through to room and if I just drag across and select them all you can see now that they're all highlighted and of course with them all selected I can do things like solo and mute. I can uh, move faders or panning. But if I go to the group slot here and I go to group 2, new group, as you can see I've already got a group for the vocals and select that. 
then what happens is that any channel that's highlighted is now assigned to that group, group two. And if I, you can see here in the inspector, a group window has appeared, group two, and I call it drums. And now that name will be applied across all of those tracks. Channels are deselected and group appears, groups appear in the inspector. For the sake of this exercise, I'm just gonna click and drag the group out of the inspector so you can see it more clearly. If I close that now, you'll see that it sort of automatically appears again back in the inspector. And we can see by default, only the volume and mute functions are selected. So that means currently, if I was to mute or adjust the volume, that would work as a group, but yet my, my solo is yet to be assigned. So in order to perform group edits, I'll need to ensure that this editing is selected and I'll also turn on my quantize lock audio, which is used for uh, editing. And now I should be able to check solo and, and pan and all of the other um, functions, including automation. And that should now work across the group. Now that your group is defined, an edit you make to any of the drum regions will be reflected on all other drum tracks as a whole. To get a feel for this process, we'll make a few simple edits. Uh, you'll also see how to use group clutch feature to temporarily disable groups when making an adjustment to an individual track. The group clutch works like an automobile's clutch temporarily taking the group out of gear while letting you perform necessary adjustments on individual tracks without affecting the whole. So let's zoom into our drum track. And I've got MIDI files here as well, just to point out. So what we'll do is we'll just make a simple edit using some scissors. So I've got my command click tool as a scissor tool. And if I wanted to cut say here between markers one and two, I'll cut and I do get this message here because it's saying, well, you've got some MIDI. So if you cut there, you're going to split the notes or so just keep those. And we'll see that that edit then is placed across all of those tracks. Same if I go to the rear of the region, I've made that edit across all of the tracks. Now let's say I wanted to turn the volume of the kick drum up. At the moment, because it's grouped, if I was to turn that kick drum sum up, you can see all of the other faders move in unison. So if I wanted to quickly bypass the group, you can see that the group is active here. If I now go to Shift and G, you'll see the group light dims in the group section on the channel. And now I can make those individual adjustments. So that's shift G and then of course if I turn that all the way down to there and I turn my group back on it will still move in unison that will stay where I left it so bypass group clutch lift the kick up back into group and now I can adjust it back to where it was before as you can see group editing is essential for keeping multiple regions locked together for region editing Flex editing techniques also benefit greatly from groups by allocating as you can see as you can see as you can see group editing is essential for keeping multiple regions locked together for region editing flex editing techniques also benefit greatly from groups As you can see, group editing is essential for keeping multiple regions locked together for region editing. Flex editing techniques also benefit greatly from groups by allowing you to perform operations such as those that you've learnt in previous lessons across multiple tracks. When the phase locked option is selected in the group inspector, the timing relationship between all members of the group stays intact regardless of how any one track is moved, stretched or quantized. This is especially important where there is some spill into all channels, especially the overheads. Without phase locked audio, 
moving the snare on the snare track without also moving the corresponding sections of the overhead track may produce an unwanted doubling effect and phase cancellation that can smear the image overall. So in this exercise you will use flex editing on all regions of the group at once whilst maintaining their phase relationships. For the sake of this demonstration you'll move a snare beat a little earlier in time. Begin by navigating to bar 39 beat 2. We'll draw a little loop cycle around that. Have a listen. And I think I'll just solo the drums as well. And we can see the snare part. Just a fraction of late. So what we'll do is we'll turn on the flex view, which is this function here. And of course that turns on globally and we will select from the flex menu from the track header, we'll select slicing and that will analyze transients and slice across all of the group. So that's now completed. So in the lower half of the drum region, the snare region, should I say, just going to drag that and when you drag it, you can feel it snapping. So I'm going to drag it to bar 32 beat 2. And if I zoom out and do it, you'll see there's my overheads, there's my room mic, there's my snare, and drag it, and everything moves in unison. The acoustic sound of the kick drum on this track doesn't really lend itself to the style. You'll remedy this by turning each kick hit using a MIDI note message using the drum replacement doubling feature. Once converted, the resulting MIDI event will trigger an electronic kick sample to give the pulse of this song an even stronger foundation. With the drum soloed, select the live kick drum track you can see that that's already been sampled and included in this project as an example, but I will do it again. And it's quite often that we actually use more than one sample. That's fine. So I'll click the live kick drum track header, go to track and navigate down to replace or double drum track. A number of things happen all at once. The drum replacement doubling dialog appears. The library opens to let you choose the type of drum sounds you want to hear. And the drum kick track automatically zooms in vertically to let you more easily identify the transient positions that are used to generate MIDI notes. Lastly, an entirely new software instrument track using the sampler um, software instrument called drum kick plus this one here is created along with a new region that contains MIDI note information for each detected drum hit. If I zoom out slightly, we can see clearly where the drums are, where the, each of my live kicks are, and I can see that each of them has a corresponding MIDI note. If for whatever reason there were extra notes in there or if there were too few I can adjust the relative threshold and you'll see that with a low fresh threshold they'll sorry with the threshold of zero they'll all disappear but as I bring the threshold down they'll start to reappear again as my kick drums are pretty constant because I've added some processing uh, there's not too much variation in the velocity which means that I'll get a pretty constant reading for each of these samples. And what I tend to do here, and I'll just mute my previous sample. Oh, of course, I've got them grouped, so I'm going to have to suspend the group. Mute the previous sample. And now I just, I'm just going to listen to these together. So my original kick and the sample, that's what I tend to do because this 
kick drum isn't a million miles off. It's not that I want to replace it totally. What I want to do is I want to blend these two sounds together. So if I have them both soloed, I can play and I can then easily scroll down each of these samples and listen to them. What I tend to do is boost the volume of the sample. And there's about 30 odd acoustic kicks. Sometimes it's not, I don't really need an additional kick. Sometimes I need more of an electronic sound or even a layered sound, uh, a body kick or transient sound. So I tend to experiment with all of them before I settle on the sound that I want. But once I've decided on the sound that I want, oh, and by the way, you'll need to make sure that you've selected the kick instrument. You can see the snare and toms as well, but if I select those, it brings up a different uh, library. So kick is the one I want, and I'm going to double this up rather than replace it totally. So what that will mean is that that will stay, that track will stay, my original recording will stay, and this one will be created underneath. So I'll just go for acoustic kick C1 for the time being and then go OK. And you'll see that my kick drum now has an additional track with MIDI notes where it's detected a audio file. And here now I can open the sampler. And of course we can go back to previous lessons one of my favorite things to do is to add some additional filtering, but of course you can play with the envelope as well. And on this track, you can also add additional EQ, distortion, sort of effects that might help to blend your sample kick in with your uh, recorded file. 